Welcome back. So in, as a reminder, in this series of videos, we're looking at uh, how to compare models to data and how to assess the performance of models. Uh, the first step that we just talked about in the last video was just a basic sanity check, making sure your model isn't doing something crazy and that it's running and producing reasonable output before you bother to compare it to data. Uh, and the second step is actually doesn't involve statistics, it involves just graphical comparisons between models and data. And there's often a lot we can learn about how a model is performing just by looking at it and assessing it visually. Um, and the real, you know, one of the first things that one does uh, that can be done on pretty much any model uh, is, is this idea of plotting uh, the predicted values that come out of the model versus what's actually observed in reality. This uh, known as a predicted observed plot. And this predicted observed plot is really kind of a, a real workhorse of model assessment. It, it shows up constantly uh, as you know, you know, kind of a first level assessment. We'll get into more detailed assessments after this, but kind of this is an important first level assessment. And we'll be asking you through the semester as we, you know, look at linear models or more complex models, uh, nonlinear models, process-based models. We'll, we'll always be doing this sort of starting with this sort of plot of predicting, plotting what our model predicted versus what we observed. Uh, and this figure shows kind of what we're hoping to see in that sort of assessment. So first thing we see is that the, the data, the, the scatter plot of the predictions versus the observations falls along the one-to-one -one line. It's unbiased. So, so it means on average, the, uh, the value that I predicted is pretty close to what was actually observed. Now, we also see no pattern in the residuals. It's not like, you know, uh, this, you know, similar to what we were talking about in, in thinking about the assumptions of linear models. You know, it's not like all the, uh, at the high end, they're all positive and the low end, they're all negative. You know, that's not, you know, yet you're not seeing an obvious trend of something you missed. So, so the, the things you missed are, are, are random. There's no, you know, apparent pattern. Uh, if there is an apparent pattern, it suggests your model is missing something. Um, and that the, the distance that points fall uh, away from the one-to-one -one line because no model is perfect, uh, but they're within the uncertainties of the model and the data. And so in this case, which you can't do for all model assessment because you don't always have it or uh, you can't visualize it effectively, but in this case, we've put the uncertainties in the observations as error bars in the y direction, and we've put the uncertainties in the model as error bars in the x direction. Um, like I said, sometimes you don't have these as separated things. Sometimes you just have, say, uh, a confidence interval in the model's prediction, but you don't have a separate independent estimate of the uncertainty in the data, or, or maybe you have uncertainty in the data, but your model's deterministic and doesn't have an uncertainty estimate in it. Or maybe you just have thousands and thousands of points, and the idea of putting error bars on thousands and thousands of dots is just, you know, on not, not a sensible visualization, you have to assess the uncertainties in other ways. Um, cool, so if this is what it looks, supposed to look like, what are some of the things we learn when it doesn't look like this? <clears throat> so sometimes what you'll see uh, when you make this predicted observed plot is that most of the data is actually uh, well calibrated, uh, but then sometimes you see outliers. And I kind of alluded to this when we were talking about linear models as well, uh, but a couple key things about outliers. The first thing is, uh, you know, you'll sometimes encounter, you know, automated algorithms for removing outliers and stuff like that. Uh, don't trust that. Um, I, I would strongly argue that out, thinking about outliers requires that you actually stop and think about your data. And that is, you need to understand why you have these outliers. And sometimes these outliers are, you can, trace back to you know, data entry errors or something where you know, data got corrupted or something and you can, you, know, you can remove the outliers because you've identified that these just, you know, these are just entered wrong or, or measured wrong. Or you, know, you can trace it back uh, to uh, you know, some other feature of the, the system where you know, something happened that corrupted this this data. So maybe it wasn't entered wrong, but you know, you know, the sample got contaminated and you took it back to the lab and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the point is if, if you can remove an outlier if you have clear evidence that it isn't actually what the data says and something else happened. Uh, by contrast, 
uh, I would argue that if your model uh, is, if there are features of the data that your model fails to capture and that these, re these were real events, um, then you know, I don't think you're justified in removing those outliers. I think you have to acknowledge that there are things your model is failing to capture. Um, you may, uh, in model cal when fitting your model, you know, you may say these are rare events. I want to remove them when fitting the LM uh, or other process model uh, because there are things the model is not designed to capture. So I capture, you know, what, what's going on 99% of the time. But you still need to put them back in in the assessment to say, you know. Uh, this is just evidence that the model is is not perfect. That there are times and places it is going to fail. And to be honest, in, in acknowledging that if, if this is really what happened in reality, that the model doesn't capture it. Uh, and sometimes that may you may there may be enough outliers that it then becomes worth kind of digging in to start thinking about you know why are you seeing those outliers? And we'll talk more about kind of the, the idea of uh, kind of how you dig into trying to figure out what a model's doing wrong when it's doing something wrong, uh, and really kind of viewing that as, as kind of a hypothesis test. Uh, another thing that can be, it's pretty rare with statistical models because of the way they're calibrated, but it can be very common with other sorts of models is to see uh, systematic biases. Uh, so in this case, um, the, the predicted values are systematically positively biased they're systematically larger than the observed values. And we see that because they're, you know, on the kind of, uh, you know, all the observed values are to the right of, of the one-to-one the -one line. So they're all, all higher than the one-to-one -one line. Um, so you have this positive bias. You can also get negative biases and this reflects your models, yeah, systematically off. Uh, sometimes that sort of systematic bias is something that's easy to fix because it's, representing a miscalibration or you can you know uh, sometimes temporarily solve this by acknowledging that you, you don't know what your model's missing but you know that uh, there's a consistent bias that can be accounted for um, you know if it's a simple additive bias you can say you know I just need to multiply you know subtract in this case you know subtract something from every value that I predict for my model the same value right? sometimes it's a multiplicative bias you have to multiply your model by something to get it to behave reasonably. It's good to understand uh, scientifically, you know, why your model is biased, but you can also use it in a practical sense by accounting for that bias post hoc. Uh, the thing that is probably even more common than um, seeing systematic uh, biases uh, is to see kind of what, what's called here a miscalibration. So. Here, this model's not clearly not on the one-to-one -one line, but it's also not clearly biased in the sense that um, you know, in all, all the positive errors and all the negative errors kind of cancel out. And on average, the model is doing fine. So if you calculate a bias statistic, you don't see one. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's clear that the, the trend is different uh, between the predictions and the observations. And in fact, what we're seeing here, this kind of reduced slope is particularly common because it's, it's pretty common for models. So, so what we're seeing here is the predicted values have a much smaller range than the observed value. The, the, the variability in the model is less than the variability in the data. And in some sense, that's really common because one of the things that models tend to do is they tend to average over uh, the variability that you see in the real world. And, and that's in part because some of that variability is just observation noise. Um, and so you don't want the model to try to capture all the noise in the data. You're trying to capture the larger patterns. Um, and so there is a tendency for models uh, to sometimes have this uh, kind of uh, flattening of their response. But it can still, you know, if it's as, it's as large as you'd see here, it's, it's troublesome because it means you, the model's not reliable. Uh, and sometimes this can be solved by, you know, it, sometimes it can be a reflection of the model needs to miss recalibrated. Calibration here means the estimation of the parameters in the model. So like when we fit a linear model, you know, what is the slope and what is the intercept? If, if this was just a simple linear model, um, then, you know, it would just suggest your slope uh, is too shallow. So in some other models, you know, you can identify specific parameters that are causing 
uh, this kind of damped response and adjust them. In other cases, it can be more complicated. Um, cool, so I'm gonna wrap up right here talking about predicted observed plots, uh, and then I'm gonna pick up in the next lecture talking about other graphical comparisons we might wanna do between models and data.